Hello, everybody, and thank you <clears throat> for your patience. We're having uh, a few technical glitches, but I think we're we're there now. Um, so, um, my name is Claire Sibthorpe, and I head the Connected Women program at the GSMA, which focuses on uh, accelerating digital and financial inclusion for women. And uh, we have some slides. I don't know if it's possible to for the for the slides to be shared. If not. No problem. <laughs> this session is called um, An Internet and Empowers All Women. Can we make it happen? Yeah, there we go. There's the slides. Thank you. Um, I think this is a, a very important question. We live in a world that's increasingly connected, and we've been working for many, many years to try and address the digital gender gap, but it still persists, and it's still, it's still very much there. So in this session, we've partnered with UNCDF to bring together a group of panelists to explore this issue and see exactly what we can do to kind of try and move the needle and reduce this digital gender gap. Um, <clears throat> but before we get into the discussion, I first wanted to, to set the context. And I'm going to talk about um, mobile internet specifically, since it's the primary and often only way that most people access the internet, um, especially women. So maybe we could go to the next slide. Um, so we at the GSMA have been measuring the, mobile internet, the gender gap in mobile ownership and mobile internet for a number of years. And um, this, is, this slide shows the gender gap um, in mobile internet um, since 2017. So you can see that in 2017, um, the women were 25% less likely than men to use the internet. Um, and we, we, while this gender gap has been, is substantial, you can see it's been reducing. So as you can see, it went from 25% in 2017, and it reduced to 15% in 2020. So we saw some good progress. However, if you now look at last year's data, the progress is not quite as rosy. Um, so we saw it was alarming that the uh, progress has stalled, and in some countries, it's even reversed. So now across low- and middle-income countries, women are 16% less likely to use mobile internet than men. And that translates into 264 million fewer women than men using the mobile internet. Um, and it's not that women are going online. What we're seeing is that women's uptake of the internet is, continues to increase, but their rate of adoption has slowed and stalled. Um, and when we look at this at a, a regional context, we see also that you know, these gaps um, vary and widen quite substantially in some regions. So for example, here in sub-Saharan Africa, women are 37% less likely to use mobile internet. And while we've seen overall across low and middle income countries, the gap has reduced in sub-Saharan Africa, that gender gap has been relatively unchanged since 2017, so it has not reduced. Um, this shows that we, we have work to do and we have, we have um, we need to have more focus on this issue. In our research and our work, we also look at the barriers. You know, why are women going online? Why is there is this going on less than men? Why is there a gender gap? And among mobile users who are aware of mobile internet, the top reported barriers to mobile internet adoption are literacy and digital skills, affordability, particularly handset affordabilities, and safety and security concerns. So I think this data just shows that there's a real clear call to action. We need more attention, more investment um, to ensure that we continue to uh, reduce the gender gap so that that line continues to go down um, and that it's not further stalled or reversed. I think uh, women have been disproportionately negatively impacted by crises like COVID and, and things that have in, in, uh, negatively impacted um, them financially and in other ways. Um, so we need, to, we need to think about how we can, how we can move this needle. And so now I'm delighted to uh, say that we have a group of panelists who are doing exactly that, who are working very hard to try and address the digital gender gap, and they're going to share with us some of their, um, their experiences and, and insights on this topic. So I'm going to introduce the panelists. So um, if I can invite you all on stage. So first we have uh, Solomon Tadesse, who's the country director for the Digital um, Opportunity Trust in Ethiopia, if you want to, to join us. And there's a, another microphone yeah um, we have online we have Angus Kinga from, from Safaricom who's a terminal business lead also online we have Vidya Y who's the co-founder and trustee of Vision and Power in the room we have uh, Annika McQuale um, from the uh, Global Digital Inclusion Partnership if you want to join us Annika and as an Ezana Razwak, who is the CEO and founder of Africa 118 here in Ethiopia. So. <clears throat> 
So I think, I mean, I shared very briefly the data, and I think it shows that, you know, we have more to we need to do. Um, this is an issue that's not going away, and in fact, you know, if we don't do something uh, more, it could get worse. Uh, so I'm going to start with you, since we're here in Ethiopia, I'm going to start with you, Solomon. Um, what do you think, from your perspective, are the main challenges that women face in accessing the internet in Ethiopia? And also maybe a little bit about what DOT is doing to bridge the digital gender divide. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, I'm not going to tell you the statistics. I just want to uh, describe uh, our own experience on the ground. Uh, Digital Opportunity Trust, uh, one of its uh, uh, implementation activities are, uh, is um, providing digital literacy for uh, women, specifically women, uh, uh, in uh, women from urban, uh, women from rural areas, and fr uh, women in all age groups, including adult women. Uh, when it comes to uh, the barriers in, uh, in terms of internet access, uh, so, uh, currently, it's uh, somehow uh, improving. Uh, access to connection or access to internet service is still a challenge for women. Uh, this is uh, mainly uh, uh, exacerbated uh, because of the challenge they have in terms of access to device. Uh, women. Uh, uh, unlike their, the, the, the boys uh, uh, or men, uh, the, uh, the access to device uh, remains a challenge for them. Uh, specifically, women in rural areas, uh, their uh, accessibility of the smartphone or uh, any feature phone is lower. And um, even the skill gap uh, on how to use it and how to meaningfully use internet is also another challenge. Uh, even those who have uh, access, uh, sometimes they, f they face uh, the, uh, a kind of cy cyber bullying, for example. You know? uh, there are women, uh, for example, I know from our program that we we have been uh, we provided uh, ICT skill training for women in garment sector, and uh, she told me from her experience that uh, she was trying to promote her products, garment products, through social medias, and there there were a lot of uh, uh, discouraging comments that are coming. Though she is strong enough to resist and uh, continue doing her own uh, uh, job, so in short, the barriers are access to the connectivity, access to device, and the skill gaps. These are the main challenge that women are facing. Uh, those is uh, working on uh, digital skill training, and you know, interestingly, uh, uh, our training programs are very much integrated with life skills trainings. So that, you know, uh, we're, uh, we're doing the mindset change so that, you know, they develop the I can do it, I can use. Uh, uh, this is simple. So that, you know, they can break the, bar the cultural barriers as well. Uh, so far, uh, we, had, we have been able to reach uh, close to uh, 7,000 women. Uh, this doesn't include the women in uh, girls in school, but uh, out of school or adult women. And uh, most of them are women in business. Uh, we provided them the basic uh, ICT skills, uh, including how they can use ICT to improve their business. So the, these are uh, just in short, I think, uh, uh, just for the sake of uh, benefit of time, uh, uh, in summary, 
The challenges are access to device, connectivity, and the skill gap. And we are addressing, we are trying to address access to device by using, collaborating with other organizations, like, for example, youth centers, schools, so that, you know, uh, unlike boys, they, they, they don't have, the, they don't go to, uh, for example, restaurants or hotels to get a Wi-Fi access. So we are trying to uh, uh, bridge such uh, challenge by using available resources from the common uh, within the community and collaborating with others. Sorry if I'm using much time. No, that's great. And that, thank you so much. That's really good to hear hear your experiences. So, I mean, you Dot has been working in this area for for quite for quite a while. I was wondering if you could share. Um, if you had sort of top two or three key learnings, what are the top two or three key insights or learnings you would share with this group from, from all your work? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, as I said it earlier, um, you know, uh, uh, we have this experience, those women even uh, who have the devices at home, uh, they, they, they're not using it because they don't have the skill and the training. And, and from the cultural barrier uh, that uh, these things, technology things, are uh, meant for men, uh, they, they are more reluctant to use it, even those who have access. So the first thing we did is we, did, uh, we integrated the, uh, the uh, digital literacy skill training with life skills so that they, they develop uh, the ability or the attitude, the mindset that they can do, they can use, they can meaningfully use it. Uh, even in our training, in the, in the, uh, when we provide the ICT skill training, we help them to uh, uh, unpack the computers and see what's inside so that you know, they, they will no more fear it, you know, fear is also one of the challenges, you see. Uh, that's one area that whenever we design, especially uh, a digital literacy program for women, adult women, or maybe um, uh, uh, a lower uh, a primary level skill or literacy levels, we should encourage them so that they, you know, they can uh, consider it that's it's simple and usable, and they can meaningfully use it. The other thing, um, in terms of access, you know, uh, 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 laptop or access to desktop, or even smartphone is very difficult for women, most women, even uh, because of the cultural barriers. If there is a smartphone, it is the boys in the house, or the 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 man uh, who is who has the privilege to use it. So, I, I, in order to support them to access such devices, uh, we we can use or collaborate with organizations like schools, uh, youth centers, uh, so that we can easily reach as many women as possible. And we are also. Uh, in our curriculum, we are trying to uh, show them how computer is operating like a mobile phone. You know, we show them uh, using what they know. Even if, even with a feature phone, we can tell them, explain them how the computer is working, so that you know they can uh, develop the confidence. Uh, the, the other thing in terms of um, financial literacy. Uh, most uh, women who are, wh whom we are providing training, you know, we, we integrate the ICT skill training with the financial literacy so that, you know, uh, they develop the confidence to use mobile money, uh, the confidence to use uh, their financial transaction using Excel, for example, to record, so that, you know, it becomes meaningful for them to learn the ICT skills, and they know how it is useful to improve their business as well. 
So uh, the co coordination and collaboration or cooperation, for example, DOT uh, is uh, a member of the uh, Women Digital Finance Initiative Hub, and we are proud of being a member because you know there are a lot of resources uh, from different uh, organizations that we can leverage to promote the digital literacy. So these are the uh, uh, lessons that we had from our experience that's useful for others also to consider. Thank you very much and for sharing that. Now I believe, so Agnes from Safaricom was going to speak, but I believe she's having some technical problems joining online. Yes, it looks like she's still not online. So, um, so we'll move to, uh, hopefully Vidya is online. Um, Vidya, are you, are you online? Oh, perfect, great. Excellent. Um, so I think, sorry, I, I hope you can hear, I, I think there's some problems in the microphones here. Um, I think it's important to not talk about women as a homogeneous group. Um, and so we know that the barriers and needs that well, experiences of women differ greatly. Um, maybe uh, can you share a bit about the key challenges to going online that women and girls uh, with visual impairments face, perhaps? Oh, no. Did you say something? Sorry, we lost you briefly, but you're back, so please continue. Yeah, but for, for people who can see, even if they can afford uh, some of the budget phones, but for a lot of people, they have to use a smart Picture 
then I don't know what is in that picture, so I am very clueless and I feel the environment is very unsafe. So even if I want to accept somebody's friend request, I cannot access any of the visual information and I can see only some of the text based messages, text based information that is available on profiles. So all of these make uh, internet very unsafe or at least it, make, it makes it feel that it's not safe because of all of these issues. This is what I have seen from observing the community and from my own experience. Thank you for sharing. It's really important, I think, to highlight that you know um, there are lots of different challenges and different different groups of people experience them very differently. So, I mean, these are very real and very um, critical challenges that you're facing. You know, what have you been doing to kind of address them, and what have you learned from your experiences in, in working to try and address some of these challenges? So, for people with visual impairment, especially, internet is a boon because. When I started using internet, when I started using computers, the world of opportunities opened up for me. So for the first time when I used email, that was the first time ever I sent a written communication to someone who could see. Imagine it was only audio and I could never send any message on my own, which a person who can see can understand. So it really, uh, I cannot even express the joy I felt when I started using email for the first time. And I could read any book of my choice, I could browse any information, I could read news. So till, till I started using technology, I either had to depend on somebody to read and if nobody is there, then I just have to skip that information and I always felt that I'm too dependent on people. So this is the case for so many of uh, people with visual impairment and I feel that for women especially it will open up if they know how to use internet and if they can have access, it can open up social interactions like never before because women already, women with visual impairment stay home and they have safety concerns and are not able to freely access access uh, world of opportunities that are already available. So what I have been doing is I have been making school education accessible, especially STEM related subjects for children with visual impairment because millions of children drop these subjects because they are fully visual, they drop them at the school level itself even before they reach high school. So we have a lot of initiatives that we have, especially we make the content accessible because there are a lot of pictures we use, 3D models, tactile diagrams and all of that. We have teacher trainings, we have uh, programs on computation thinking and all of these initiatives. Along with that, we really focus on digital literacy. Because now what happened is, uh, during the pandemic, we, we saw that a lot of regular schools seamlessly shifted onto digital platforms without any hurdle. But as I mentioned, the challenges that were there for uh, teachers and students with visual impairment, they were not able to do that and literally all schools were stuck. So this is the time when I personally made audio tutorials for teachers in the pandemic and uh, also a lot of teachers are using it and they have been translated to different languages and majority of the teachers who are using this are women. Now I really didn't think that people will find innovative use cases for some of the tutorials that I made. So there is one app called Be My Eyes where you can if you are visually impaired, you can call anybody on that app and someone will pick up your call and help you with whatever assistance you need remotely. So, some of the women have been using this platform actually to match their clothes with bangles or some other accessories that they wear. I mean, I thought, I never thought of this use case when I made these tutorials. And when we talk about kids, it's really important that girls really learn technology right from the beginning so that they don't have to struggle when they become adults. So we are taking up uh, digital literacy, we have designed a curriculum specifically for children and we are training children right from grade 1 on all of the computer and phone and everything that may be useful. And I feel when they grow up they will be able to use it just like any other person who can see. So some of the other things that I can think of is we really need to, like forums like these are there, so we need to educate some of the stakeholders that are uh, 
that make policies on these issues and say that there exist these groups and even these groups of people like women with visual impairment needs to be considered while making decisions and we will really need a lot of people to go to villages and uh, some of the places where visually impaired women Thank you so much. It sounds like what you're doing is making a huge impact, uh, really inspirational. Um, I believe Agnes has now been able to join. Agnes, are you, are you um, online now? Yes, I'm oh. online. Great. <laughs> Sorry for the technical difficulties, um, but glad that you were able to join. Um, so Safaricom has been really a kind of a leader in working to address the mobile gender gap. You know, doing you guys have been doing amazing, amazing stuff, and you've seen really good uh, outcomes. Um, what? So it'd be good to hear from your perspective as you know, an operator on the ground. You know, what do you see as the key barriers that need to be addressed? Uh, thank you. Uh, I think the biggest barrier Great, really good to hear um, your perspective. And um, and you've really, um, we good to hear from you. I mean, you've really been tackling this at scale. Um, in um, and I was wondering, you know, how have you um, gone to kind of really reach women at scale to really move that needle? And um, the same question as the others, you know, what are the kind of key main lessons that you've learned from those efforts that you think would be useful to share? Uh, some of the big efforts that you have taken uh, to move the needle, I think the, part, the main one that is addressing the biggest barrier which is affordability. So if you look at some of the programs that Firefox has done, uh, it includes device financing, these are pay per use models, whereby it allows women uh, or people to be able to just pay a small deposit and pay as low as $20 per day until they get to a final device. What that has done is actually lower the barrier of acquisition for smartphones in the country. And I think up to the date we have uh, gotten to sell around one million devices with that safe and use model. Another way For the last year, uh, the last aspect, so over indexing products, and so over indexing on uh, acquisition of devices by women, actually at 54 percent uh, to 46 percent to men. So, some of those initiatives are really have addressing affordability. Another key one uh, is also about accessibility because, uh, in as much as you have the uh, right price devices, if you don't have the right channel, you actually penetrate the chair where most of the women are not to type, then um, you will not uh, you will not be able to succeed. So also uh, using our uh, to uh, consumer channels, making sure we have partnerships with outlets that are this uh, even in particular areas where uh, uh, you get a lot of women uh, out not only digital devices, that has been a big And then the third one I would say uh, is also a very important thing that is done. Uh, is actually doing campaigns that are targeted uh, 
primary citizen, and this goes as far as even if the uh, the face of the cafe or the act or the uh, the people in the act that are really like women. And finally, because we're a telco, I can't leave without mentioning affordable data uh, data packs or uh, data bundles, because that is what is enables women to actually get connected to the internet. So I think uh, I'll summarize that by saying um, device financing, the right campaigns, the right uh, channels and route to consumer, and also having affordable uh, resources, data bundles that will enable the, the usage of the paid devices. It sounds like you've been taking a really holistic approach to tackling many of the barrels, barriers and having a, a, quite a bit of success. So that's thanks for sharing. Um, I'm going to turn to you now, Annika. Um, so I mentioned uh, you've been well, you've been working for many years in the digital gender divide, and I mentioned at the beginning that in Af sub-Saharan Africa, women are 37 percent less likely than men to use the internet, and that really hasn't changed over the last number of years. So I mean. If you question, why should we you know why is this such an important issue? Why should we really be caring so much about it? Okay. Thank you. Thanks so much for this uh, opportunity. And I, I have to say that having worked in digital inclusion for as long as I have, uh, and with all the intention of being inclusive, I, I want to congratulate you on having uh, Vidya on this because I, I don't know about any of you, but we've been talking about digital inclusion for so long, but never really having people who are challenged with visual impairment uh, on digital platforms speak for themselves. And this is a great example of nothing about us without us uh, by having her come and enlighten us as well in terms of the work that we are doing. So thank you. I wanna just, I was just really touched uh, by that, that it just feels strange that in so long of us talking about digital inclusion, we've never really seen it um, uh, represented this way. Uh, in terms of women and, and why it's really important for them to be online, I think it's really important for us to understand that this exclusion of women on digital is actually a symptom of what exists in our society and what we need to fix in our society in general. It's not unique to digital. It's a representation of the digital, of the gender inequalities that exist within our society and manifest themselves in the digital space. So the same kind of uh, rationale why we believe that girls must go to school is exactly you know the same reasons why they must also be uh, on uh, digital, uh, given digital access and included in digital. Most of the research that we've seen and, and, and worked on has shown us that when women are able to be empowered uh, and, and have access to digital, they have an opportunity to really transform their lives. Um, you know, but the digital inequality that exists right now puts them at a disadvantage. When we look at how men use uh, digital access vis-a-vis -vis how women use digital access, we still find a huge difference that women are less like, those who are online are still less likely to use uh, their access in a way that is empowering and could potentially contribute towards uh, uh, improving their socioeconomic standing. Less likely to look for a job online, less likely to run a business online compared to the men who are also online. So we have to fix it uh, because what it means also is that, especially in this region where everyone is talking about digital economy, I don't think there's a session here this week alone that has not touched on 
digital economy. It means that we are once again creating economies that are exclusive of women. We cannot afford to do that. Uh, mo the most recent research uh, that we, our team had worked on was the cost of exclusion. To really bring it home that there is a real cost to excluding women uh, from digital. And I think that cost uh, on the last research was about losing about a trillion US dollars in our economies by not including women uh, in digital development. And when you think about it uh, in terms of just uh, where we, you know, this, this divide that currently exists, it's not just only affecting this generation, quite frankly. It also has an impact. This exclusion has an impact on the next generation. Because uh, just to pick up a little bit on what uh, my fellow panelists mentioned around the experience of women online, Young girls are also observing how women in this, of this generation are experiencing violence online. And they are learning that being online is not a good thing. Uh, and therefore opting, the same way that uh, women our generation are now beginning to self-censor themselves uh, from engaging online, we are also creating a potential challenge with the next generation of young girls who are not going to be able to see the the full value of actually being online. So it's really important that we, we fix this uh, divide, but it's also understand that it's not isolated to online. We All the SDGs are important around uh, gender equality, but more so on digital, so we don't leave women behind again. Thanks, and, um, and thanks for raising about the safety issues. So, you know, we've been hearing in this panel about, you know, affordability, literacy, making sure things are relevant, accessible. Uh, but I also mentioned at the beginning that one of the top barriers in our research is sort of safety and security concerns that are stopping people from going on online. Um, so, we, I would, since you mentioned, especially at the end there, you know, what do you think, uh, you know, we can do about that issue and, you know, and comments on, on yeah, that issue and how we can address it. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, it's really important for us to acknowledge that, yes, uh, you know, affordability is a big issue for why women are not online. There's a skills issue. But also there's an environmental issue online, which is the violence against women that exists online, which uh, contributes towards uh, the digital divide. We have to be intentional. These things, because violence against women exists in society in general, it's not going to fix itself because we gave women computers and skills to be online. We have to be intentional about ending uh, this. And that really means that we need to look at policies around safety. We need to look at different, it's multi-sectoral as well. There's a, a responsibility that platforms must assume in making sure that we've got the safety uh, available online. There's a, a role for civic tech and civil society organizations around educating women on how to protect themselves online the same way they do offline. Uh, and there's a role for government as well. You know, it's really interesting that there's a, this huge uh, movement of updating cyber crimes uh, laws in most countries. Um, I don't know which country is not doing that right now, but most of our countries are doing that. But what we are finding is that um, there is no enforcement or implementation of this. There's the adoption of new uh, wonderful laws that also ban revenge porn, but when revenge porn happens in a very public space, no one acts. We still wait for the victim to be burdened with the responsibility of reporting again. When we've got laws that we've adopted from somewhere that are very clear about what must actually happen when uh, these in instances are uh, okay. So we, we have to make sure that the internet is safe for everyone. It starts with all of us have equality and a right to safety in most of our constitutions. And so we need to start it from there, including the new instruments, legal frameworks that we've adopted in most countries, especially here in Africa. We are really good at uh, adopting these uh, new uh, frameworks, right? But the implementation has been really, really lacking. Uh, and uh, online violence against women takes v many forms now. It's beyond just dragging. It's beyond just dragging, meaning trolling of women online, right? It's beyond also just uh, targeting pol uh, female politicians and uh, journalists in particular, I think those two groups of women are the ones who, who probably experience the most abuse. 
but it actually goes on uh, to things such as hijacking women's accounts online uh, and hijacking their platforms. There are Zoom meetings we experienced yesterday, right, with one of the sessions here. So the same way that we are vigilant around anti-terrorism on cyber spaces, we want government to have the same fever to actually deal and address this kind of terrorist attack on women online, uh, both in group meetings as well as individually uh, when they're expressing themselves. There's no reason why a woman who's trying to sell something online should be faced with negative comments that discourage her from doing that. Uh, while we are working on goals around financial inclusion, uh, so, because it just doesn't make sense, you know. So I think that we need to educate ourselves a lot more about the experience of women. Uh, and it starts with believing them, right? I think a lot of our challenge is that we don't believe women when they tell us these things are happening to them. So we need to really start by believing them, uh, educating ourselves, and then beginning to look at action and interventions that can be taken each sector has a role here. Platforms have a huge responsibility, civil society as well, but government certainly. Thanks, that's a powerful call to action. Um, and I, I agree that we, it's an issue that we need to, to really tackle. Um, it will move to you, Izana. So Africa 118 has been working with women entrepreneurs um, here in Ethiopia and trying to get them online. So what are the challenges that you've been trying um, to address and how? And I don't know if you have any also response to any comments from Annika about what their experiences are. Yeah, uh, Yeah, with pleasure. So thank you. Um, the f um, our focus is on the, the gap. So the 90% of women entrepreneurs or SMEs in Ethiopia that have no online presence. Um, so when you compare that with mobile penetration, about 50%, uh, only 10% of women SMEs or entrepreneurs have an online presence. And so I think part of the conversation was around infrastructure, part of it on having affordable devices, but you also need to have local content. And so when we did our research around, you know, why are they not online, essentially there was three basic reasons. The first one is around awareness. So if I have a leather shop or if I'm in the fashion business or... I'm in the coffee export business. Are there people looking for my services today? And the answer, um, spoiler alert, the answer is yes. There's plenty of people looking for your services. Uh, secondly, if I'm aware, uh, how do I bo go about being online? And so the expertise is missing. So what, do I, what is my first step? And then the third one is around affordability. So um, we found that the price point is around sort of $100, so $100, $200, more than that becomes difficult for a lot of SMEs. Um, so we did some design uh, thinking with the GSMA, so we're part of the GSMA Innovation Fund, and we came up with different solutions to try to tackle each of these three um, issues. Uh, part of it around the skills development, so I think that's been a lot of the theme around here, and I know that our colleagues at DOT that we worked with did something. So if, if uh, specifically to what I'm doing, so if I'm a tour operator, how should I be present? Yeah, you know, What should I be doing? What should I be sharing? So coming up with, and we have a partnership with Google as well, and uh, the GSMA has a mobile toolkit. So basically packaging it for the entrepreneurs. And what, what does she need to be able to professionally be uh, online? And secondly, we developed uh, what we call a digital starter pack. So it's a professional online presence priced affordably, so around 5,000 bur, which is about $100. And what we've seen is that the results have been quite um, impactful. So we did uh, sort of a, an impact survey. And what we found is that uh, we supported around 1,800 SMEs, of which 1,200 were women, so around 70% or so. 90% um, of them never had a presence before they came uh, with on the program. Um, of them, 84% indicated that they saw a significant lift in their business, so this did have an impact. Um, and they also claimed that around 78%, my life has improved. Part of it might come back to what you were saying earlier around um, uh, confidence. Uh, so, so part of having uh, presence means my business exists. I can, it's almost like having a business. My business exists, I can point people there. Um, so we did find uh, what we believe is one solution to help address uh, this gap. And our belief is that this is something that can be scaled to other entrepreneurs and other markets as well. 
I said I'm going to ask you a question I've asked a couple of the others too is, you know, what are the kind of main learnings that you've had from your experience that you think is worth sharing with others who are trying to, to do something similar and get women online? Yeah. Uh, so so uh, I'd say maybe three. The, fir the first one is uh, uh, basically having a target or, 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 or measuring. So uh, our intervention was designed to ensure that at least 50% yeah, of the participants were women or women-led organizations. Um, uh, and what we found is initially in Ethiopia is difficult because less than 30% of businesses are owned by women. So we actually had to be very intentional around how to find them. And it's something that we measured every month. Huh? So we'd have, so we started below and then we ended up at 67%. So, so something, I mean, very simple, <laughs> probably very obvious, but making sure that we have uh, a, a KPI and that we're measuring it. Uh, the second thing, and probably the most useful, is that we went with the, we found very strong women-led SME organizations and we partner with them. So what we found is they have the relationship, they know how to work with their members, the trust is there. A lot of the things in terms of when does the training happen, what's the format, the time, all those things had already been solved by the uh, organi SME organizations themselves. So what we had to do is basically adapt our training to what they found and we found that there the impact was much, was much higher. And then the last thing is, as we observed, we found that sessions that were led by women trainers where the participants were women and the case studies were also women were the ones that had the highest impact. So we basically replicated that as much as we could across it. And I, th I think that's sort of the, the things that we found were effective for, for our intervention. Super, really interesting. Um, I want to make sure there's time for questions from the room and online. So I'm even going to ask, uh, uh, before I open to questions from the panelists, if you could, as one final reflection, if you had just one sentence, you know, what would be the most impactful action um, we could take to kind of get women online and ensure that they're empowered online? Maybe I'll start with the online. Um, Vidya, do you want to go first? Uh, if you had one, what would you say is the most impactful thing we could do, Vidya? Yeah, I feel that we need to include women in the internet ecosystem right from the beginning because uh, only then they can choose what they want instead of someone having to choose what they want. And we should also include people with people uh, from the marginalized groups and not only privileged women. I feel in, if, when we do that, then women will be empowered right from the beginning. Great, thanks. And Agnes, what do you think is the most impactful thing we can do? Um, I think uh, from my perspective is uh, having the courage to actually take the commercial decisions that are required to drive uh, women inclusion. Because of course we're living in a commercial world and there'll be some costs associated with it. So having that courage to actually uh, make the big bets on women and uh, also be able to finance and uh, and uh, and finance any, any initiatives that are actually the lead to women acquiring devices, especially around the area of device affordability, because that has actually been a barrier for a very long time. Then I'll, I'll, I'll couple that by saying also having the right use case and the right content that is tailor-made to the women will also take us uh, very far on uh, the inclusion journey. And I'll just, what, what would you say? It's the most impactful thing we can do. Uh, very simply, to, uh, accountability, holding ourselves accountable for the outcome. So having a goal, making sure we work towards the goal so we become creative in, our, in finding solutions. So I think that's probably the, the one that I think has the biggest uh, impact from our perspective. Great. Annika? Yeah, along those same lines, I think uh, it's really important that we mainstream gender in ICT policies and set very realistic targets so that we can f utilize the resources we have, such as universal service and access funds, to actually uh, advance our gender inclusion. Great, and Salon? Thank you. Um, creating a momentum so that how we can reach as many women as possible. Uh, from DOT's experience, we are using a use-led model where uh, we create a, a use champions who will be uh, providing the skill training uh, for women in their community so that, you know, we can sustain and create a momentum to reach as many women as possible. Thank Great. You. Thanks. And I'm I know we're, I think we're getting to time, but I do want to give people a chance to speak. I know we're uh, asked a couple of questions. Um, we did start a few minutes late, so I'm going to take the organizers. Uh, 
uh, and give us a couple minutes extra at the end. Um, we have lots of hands. I think we only have time maybe for one online question, one in the room question, and the, the panelists will be here, I'm sure. Um, so I think, yeah, you want to, and then I don't know if there's one online as well. Um, so I think I saw her hand up first. Um, <clears throat> And if there's a, if we, we ask both questions, then we get the panels to answer, and then we'll. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Judy Okite uh, from Kenya ICT Network, uh, where we work with policy and uh, regulation. Um, it's not really a question; it's a comment. Um, I appreciate the discussion that we are having here today, but I would like to um, request that we extend this. Uh, conversation, not just to women with uh, visual disability, but to disability as a whole. Um, even as we sit here today, if there was a woman here who was not able to hear, um, I can see the captions going on and off, then we've actually excluded them from that uh, conversation. So let's include the women with disability as a whole and uh, join into this conversation. Thank you. Great comment. And is there anything online? There's nothing online yet, but I encourage those online to raise yeah, their yeah. hand if they have any so, questions. We'll give one more question and we'll, we'll have a closing. Um, thank you, very informative panel. I've learned a lot. My name is Danielle Smith. I'm a sociologist at Syracuse University in Syracuse, New York. Our project um, focuses on training teachers in rural Ghana. And um, we will be exhibiting at the booth. Please stop by to see a device that does provide connectivity. Um, but my comment is that our research suggests that as important as it is to um, work on inclusivity and access for women, it is also important to include boys and men. Because what we find is that boys and men who are equally as vulnerable, not based on gender, but based on other demographics, geography, social class, um, other life statuses, when they're excluded, women actually suffer. And that's some of the things we're hearing where um, online violence against women escalates. Within their households, their financing can be appropriated. They're subject to more domestic violence to emotional violence um, perpetrated by the men within their households and women are silent about this. So our approach has been to be inclusive of boys and men in our project and I just wondered if you could comment um, on a more holistic approach to digital inclusivity. Does anybody want to take that and then I will, we'll have to close it up after that. And, and online panelists as well, welcome to join in. Thank you. Uh, actually, uh, um, in any program uh, we are running, uh, it is men who are get, uh, taking the advantage than women. Uh, I know uh, 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 bringing the agenda to main that the inclusivity of women is also helping the family or helping the community so that, you know, uh, uh, the lost opportunity uh, because of the uh, exclusion can be uh, minimized. Uh, but, you know, uh, we are more focusing on women because they're more disadvantaged and they don't have access. Um, even at home, in, in, a, in a patriarchal community like Ethiopia, if there is any device, it is the man who is using that device. Women are denied. Uh, women are not encouraged to, to attend such kind of, uh, even uh, when they are in school, they are not that much uh, encouraged. Uh, we had, we had uh, a training program, uh, Girls Can Code, just four or five years ago. Um, we were trying to bring high school students to the center and, uh, and teach them coding so that you know they can be motivated 
to uh, continue or pursue higher education in technology or in STEM field. Um, uh, still, even uh, not many of the, the uh, girls were uh, able to pursue at a, a tertiary level with such kind of uh, uh, fields or engineer, engineering and STEM fields. Still, you know, there are a lot to do to include women than men. I understand, yeah, men should be supportive and we have to work, uh, we have to uh, intervene to uh, aware them that uh, if they are supporting them, it is supporting themselves. That's, that's I, I think, what I can add. And unfortunately, I think we're, 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 we're out of time, but I really want to thank the panelists very, very, very much. But we have, uh, we, please don't go, we have a final comments, but thank you so much, panelists, for sharing your insights and expertise. Um, I'm now going to introduce uh, Mr. Endesha Tisfei, um, the Digital Finance Lead in Ethiopia for UNCDF, who's going to make some closing remarks. Um, and uh, we're delighted to have partnered with UNCDF on this event and also to be partnering with you on um, the Women's Digital Financial Inclusion Advocacy Hub. So please come. Yes, please come and welcome. Please take my seat. Good afternoon. I think uh, we are running to the evening session. So just maybe to put into perspective, I think Onika earlier was mentioning about, we're talking about uh, the symptoms, not the root causes of the different activities. So whatever that we are seeing usually evolves around uh, the economic, in, uh, economic activity engagement of women, if we are talking about access to device and others, if we go to the rural part of different countries, that's the scenario. So on how we'll be able to enforce implementation of policies. That's an area that we need to work on. Uh, indicators targeting uh, women on different policies and pr strategies that we designed, that's something that uh, we are lacking across uh, countries. Uh, we have as UNCDF uh, a tool that we use to measure inclusivity of digital economies where which is uh, inclusive digital economy scorecard that's what we are seeing in most countries that's a missing uh, piece so pushing engagement is in these areas uh, are sound clear thank you very much excellencies colleagues and friends it has been a pleasure uh, to work with you uh, today and partners with GSMA to host this session on such a relevant topic for our country right now I have enjoyed enormously uh, the participation from all speakers and particularly those vibrant female voices in person and online. Listening to you has all inspired me greatly and we are excited about continuing to engage with all of you in this collaborative spirit. At UNCDF, we remain committed to advancing women's economic empowerment by leveraging the potential of digital financial services and digital tools. We are working closely with both local and international stakeholders, private or government, because we are convinced that it's only together that we can close the digital gender gap. As you have heard from speakers, the Women's Digital Financial Inclusion, WDFI, Advocacy Hub is UNCDF new flagship gender initiative in Ethiopia to promote inclusive policy change and support the creation of gender inclusive digital economies. We are working with diverse partners uh, in Ethiopia to catalyze collective action and break down barriers when faced to become financially and digitally included. This hub and the coalition in Ethiopia are a platform for change, grounded on evidence, capacity building, practical implementation, and most importantly, collaboration. Similarly, our engagement with the Digital Financial Service Working Group in Ethiopia provides and other countries, uh, particular to underserved committee members, uh, through a policy advocacy and lobbying, networking, collaboration, learning, and capacity building, we can ensure fair access and equal 
participation of all Ethiopian citizens in the digital economy. Lastly, our strategic partnership with IBM and Ministry of Innovation and Technology in Ethiopia and other similar ministries in other countries also exemplifies our active efforts to ensure all individuals have the skills they need to thrive in the digital economy with specific attentions given to the youth and women. Upskilling the digital capabilities uh, of the world's workforce, particularly women, will further accelerate efforts towards addressing the digital gender divide and support the government's vision. For example, in Ethiopia we have the Digital Ethiopia 2025 person with Ministry of Innovation's plan to reach 70% of Ethiopians to be digitally uh, literate, where people have, uh, like women, have access to devices and internet at schools, looking towards uh, implementing the inclusive digital economy in the country. To conclude, let me refer back to the beginning of our panel session question, which is, can we make it happen? An internet that empowers all women. We know that closing the mobile gender gap among women and girls around the world is key to supporting our future generations. We know that women, uh, when women and girls can access, own, operate, and adequately, or as earlier said by Mr. Sermon, meaningfully use technology, they can transform their lives, create opportunities for economic growth, and improve their well-being and the society at large. Well, we have a saying, right? Like, educate a woman and you educate a village, right? Not just a family or a single person. So as the country embarks on the next stage of this exciting journey, the real test will be how effectively we can make this happen. How meaningfully we invest in women's capability and help them take full advantage of the new opportunities that digital transformation can bring. My call to action to you today is to encourage you to work together, one, and to work with us by joining the Women's Digital Financial Inclusion Advocacy Hub Network in Ethiopia. Do not miss out on the opportunity to contribute to supporting the digital economy that elevates women's voices. Lastly, let me share my deepest gratitude to GSMA, my colleagues from UNCDF, and the team behind Serigap this event for bringing us all here together and enabling this discussion to accelerate inclusive change. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anderson. And thanks everybody for coming and joining. I believe we can make it happen. Let's continue the conversation.